Assalamu alaikum. Good morning and welcome to um, all our listeners who have logged on to listen to our um, talk this morning uh, webinar, uh, which is titled The Malay Garden, Familiar Fragrances, Favorite Flavors. I'm uh, Zahim Al-Bakri, the Deputy President of uh, Badam Raisan and uh, Council Member. And today's talk will be delivered by Professor Emerita Dato, Dr. Wazir Jahan Karim. Uh, she is a fifth generation Jawi Peranakan from, uh, from Penang. She pioneered Aslian uh, research and was the first woman anthropologist to live with the Mahabatis tribe of Kerry Island for two years from the 1972 to 1974. Um, from her years there, she uh, published a, a work, uh, Mahabatis Concepts of Living Things. Um, since then, she's uh, published quite a number of um, articles and um, books. Um, in, she's um, including um, Women in Developing Southeast Asia, The Global Nexus, Political Economies, Connectivity and the Social Sciences. Um, Prof, Prof is um, now a life member of Clare Hall, Cambridge, and um, she continues to publish as an independent scholar and uh, life member of Clare Hall and has pioneered research into the culinary arts and the anthropology of food, including the conservation of Malay and Jawi Pranakan parody theater, which I'm also fascinated to find out about. Maybe she'll come back and do another talk about that. Um, she's now embarking on further research on Malay urban farming and has completed, is completing a book, um, it's almost finished one last chapter, apparently, um, co-authored with her son, Nurul Karim, entitled, the same title as today's talk, The Malay Garden and Table. Familiar fragrances, favoured flavours. And let's introduce uh, the professor now. Um, Prof, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello, Dato. <laughs> Hello, yeah. how are you this morning? I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> It's lovely having you here with us. Um, oh, I'm, thank you for inviting me. I'm so looking forward, I'm sure our listeners are as well. I'm so so, so looking forward to um, the talk this morning. It's uh, two subjects which I, um, you know, love. Uh, one subject in particular is the Malay food. Yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, um, yeah. and I know that you're focusing some part of it on ulam and I'm very fascinated. I, I love yeah. um, <laughs> Sambam Chan and, you know, eating ulam so. I'm looking forward yeah. to this very much, and as, you, as I'm sure our listeners are as well. Um, so yeah. I'll pass it over to you, and um, we'll catch up a bit later for a question and answer session. Yes. All right. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. So, over to uh, you. Thank you. A happy and peaceful Sunday to all of you listening in this morning. I'd like to thank the Malaysian Heritage Trust of Badan Warisan Malaysia and Think City Institute for inviting me to make this presentation on the Malay Garden. I just completed a book on the Malay Garden to table with Chef Nouril Karim of Jari House, actually my son. And I'm happy to do a fleeting overview of the book for those of you who are interested. Now, generally this talk refers to urban Malay women, including Pranakan Muslims, like the Jawi Pranakan, who have gardens or lawns or spaces to place pots to grow their herbal aromatics and flowering plants. So the scented gardens of Malay women. Uh, this may sound very grand, but actually it could be just a plot in the garden or a few pots and a space in the lawn. But whatever it is, we must remember it is the woman's domain. And this is where she spends her early morning, early mornings and evenings tampering with her plants. And you know, as the Ibu Ruma, this is where she actually treasures her fragrant flowers and herbs. Now, this is a special place in her life, the garden, and I, the, one of the most precious plants which she would grow would be the jasmine in Malay, uh, the malo or malati. And traditionally, Malay women would wrap this in a sangol. They would tread it and wrap it in a sangol around their hair or place it under the pillow before they sleep. Um, 
The Arabian jasmine, of course, is the most popular, the most common in Malaysia. Uh, over the last four decades or so with Islamic revivalism, the hijab has taken over, you know, and the sangol has sort of virtually disappeared, except, of course, for the islands of Southeast Asia in Java, Lombok, Bali. Uh, here you see the photo of a Javanese bride in her full classic headgear with strings of Arabian jasmine cascading down her shoulders. And on the right, you will see the Syria Junjon, which is Malay, modern Malay. You would see jasmine flowers, orchids, and something new, baby's breath. But um, of course, although the Malay woman no longer wears a sangol, I, I actually seldom hear the word sangol now even, you know. She would still treasure this flower as a potpourri or the bunga rampai. Uh, the jasmine would still be used for weddings and for room decorations, like the bridal beds. And if you go throughout the whole of Southeast Asia, the jasmine is still the most popular flower to be used for all these functions. And of course, in India, you know, no one, the jasmine is like the superpower flower for weddings. And next we come to the bawa or the rose. Now the rose is always the center of admiration for friends. And this is where the Malay woman gets her status because it's really hard to grow roses in the tropics and it attracts a lot of bugs. Now my late mom, uh, Bismillah, who used to grow lots of orchids with my father, my late father, hundreds of orchids actually, she would still have a little rose bush in the garden. And this is where she would uh, cut a rose a day whenever it bloomed, put it in a fluted vase to scent the living room. And of course, Malay women would treasure the rose for their pot puri or their bunga rampai and for weddings. Now we would all, most of you would have heard of rose essence and rose water, which is very commonly used in Malay puddings and, you know, desserts. And of course, for rice, like nasi biryani and also like nasi minyak, you would use rose essence and rose water. Next is this very beautiful undervalued flower, the gardenia, a flower for men but grown by women. Why I say it is for men? Because I remember my mom used to grow the gardenia for my father. You know, in the post-colonial stage, the men would wear it in the, the label of the suit when they went out for formal dinners or functions. And my mom would always make sure that my father would have a fresh gardenia for one of these functions. And during the COVID lockdown, I noticed that the gardenia came back into fashion again. And I noticed that a lot of the younger members of our Ulam club, introduced by our legendary Kul Salma Nasutian, actually would make the gardenia into a tea, a fragrant tea. And this really fascinated me because women of my generation, um, close to a generation above most of the members, will possibly not think of make, making the gardenia into a tea. But now we plant the gardenia, my sisters and I, uh, we plant the gardenia all over our garden in memory of our beloved father, who really loved this flower. Next, we have the alang lang and the chumpaka, kenanga or chumpaka. These are like two twin sisters. They all are seen together, these two beautiful flowers with the most intoxicating scent on earth. And I have the Lang Lang in my garden, but of course not the Chimpaka. It is a giant timber tree and it's hard to grow in a garden. Actually, to confess, I did have a Chimpaka tree, but my husband chopped it down in favor of a Rambutan tree, which is growing too close to my Chimpaka. And I actually think I, I actually was quite mad with him for many, many months for this. But of course, the chumpaka is a very hard tree to handle and, you know, not many women have this. But we do, we do relish this flower. And it is made into essential oils for uh, Malay, Arabian and French perfumery. Uh, next, we have this uh, very sensuous emotive flower, this Bunga Sundal Malam. Uh, a very sad name the Malays gave to it. 
the, the night prostitute or the mistress of the night would be a kinder word for this extremely beautiful flower. And I would like to say that most of these fragrant flowers are now considered edible. And in our Ulam club, most of the members would possibly start with a question. Oh, oh, this flower is so pretty. Is it edible? Can I eat it? Can I make it into a tea? Uh, could it be made into a soup for my mom and my kids? But, you know, for a woman of my generation, looking at this Bunga Sundal Malam, the night prostitute, I would never think of cooking it or making it into a tea. It is a mystical, magical flower associated with the spirits of the forest and the Orang Bunyan because this flower has a nocturnal scent which is released at night. And when this scent is released, this is when the Orang Bunyan or the human spirits would lure young women and children into the forest to sleep with them at night. So this flower will possibly not ever be eaten. Now I have a very nice video I took on the night of Chap Gomi of this beautiful flower in my garden in full bloom under the full moon and I'd like to show it to you now. Here's the video. I swear I could hear the flowers breathe when they release the scent and this exotic scent is something you can't forget. You know, it is like something between the jasmine and the gardenia in full force. So this is my chap gourmet gift for us that night. Well, there you are, the mistress of the night in full bloom, a blossoming maiden. Um, next, we come to the Malay table. So lots of people who want to know, do Malays really eat flowers? And I, I, I would like to say that, of course, they do. But the flowers they eat would be those associated with their ulam, the shoots, legumes, berries, and leaves, which are made into that ulam platter. And the sundudu, for example, which you see here, has wonderful blackberries. And this is also made into a paste, uh, which can also be part of the ulam. And the Malays also eat all kinds of ginger flowers, like the turmeric flower and the kantan. And these are flowers which are known to rejuvenate the blood in the postpartum stage of childbirth, especially. So these flowers have now become celebrity flowers of celebrity chefs and they're very expensive to buy. And if you can grow it in your garden, it'd be like a wonderful bonus. So the range of ulam and edible weeds is actually infinite in the Malay village. And in the urban landscape, we would have some of these uh, young mango trees, maybe we would have the belimbi and the belimbi uh, can be made into a wonderful relish with young mango and with uh, tomatoes, with a bit of sugar and vinegar and chopped um, uh, prawns. And it could be taken with this wonderful nasi ulam, which you see here on the right. And the nasi ulam uh, is actually something which is very traditional in Malay and also with the nyonyas. The nyonyas love the nasi ulam and we need a minimum of seven types of shoots to make a nasi ulam complete. And we must remember to mix it with hot white rice to bring out the full flavors of the nasi ulam, the herbal rice. So here you have uh, a cooked meal, my garden cooked up 
for our book. So this is where we taste the garden. So as part of uh, my book, we had to come up with this for a whole morning. My son and I, uh, Noril, we did all these uh, wonderful Malay dishes. We have the free range eggs with belindi and fish curry. The fish, of course, we got it from a local um, Malay fisherman. We didn't actually have it anywhere in our garden. So we have bamboo shoots and transparent noodles, of course, transparent noodles from the market. We have moringa leaves with sweet potato from the garden. Blue lamoni rice with pea flour from our garden. Stuffed mackerel, again from the Malay fisherman, with mango and lemon grass uh, relish and prawn paste sambal with wing beans, our famous kacang boto. Um, this, we cooked up quite a meal, but of course, this meal would not be complete without our ulam basket. Now, ulam baskets have become very, very popular uh, recently, even in Penang, Tanjung Bunga, where I live. So you can actually eat up this beautiful floral arrangement, a centerpiece, and to make it very lovely, you could combine the uh, kokuruma flowers, turmeric flowers with kantan and with uh, young mungkudu or cashew nut flowers. And you get like a whole array of colors. And you can imagine but by the end of your meal, this ulam basket would have gone and it would be the most productive uh, centerpiece you would have come across. Uh, voila, now we have our famous uh, samba blajan which is the most unifying factor in Malaysian culture, I would think. Uh, every Malay, Chinese or Indian relishes a sambal blachan, which we take with our salt fish, young uh, sliced cucumber, again with our wing beans, with all kinds of herbs. And here we have, uh, you know, mint, and we also have the king salad. Uh, and I think this is when you can actually experiment and be more creative. I mean, you chop up all this in your ulam. You chop it up fine and you mix it with some of lajan and sugar and vinegar. You get like one of the most nicest karabus you can think of. Well, this is what we got from a day's harvest during the COVID lockdown. Uh, in our uh, ulam garden club, uh, every young family would come up with something like this and they would proudly post it you know, in the chat. And this is what we in my family came up with, uh, not just for our house, of course, to eat, but also for our restaurant, Jawi House. So here we have uh, free range eggs from our tree hens. We have lemony shoots and flowers. We have the cassava shoots, the pucho ubi. We have the cassava rhizome, uh, ubi kayu. The sweet leaf and chikoman is also from our garden. Pea flowers and lemongrass and serai. We also have the pandan and a host of other things. And this could last a family for like two, three days. And you just imagine it's all organic, it's fresh, and you know, cooked from your own garden, your good earth. Um, next, we come to our small project our permaculture project, where for every two weeks, the bio waste from Jawi House is brought to our garden and is mixed with the eggshells of our free range uh, hens and with the droppings from our free range hens. This is mixed with the leftover stems and our ulam and our cooked vegetables and the fallen leaves and all made into a compost. If you come to my garden in Tanjung Bunga, you will see that all the compost heaps are actually those of my of the chef Noel, and all the beautiful fragrant flowers are mine. So we do have a shared landscape and a tapestry, uh, intergener intergenerational tapestry, where we learn to share uh, a lot of our produce and our lives. And of course, I think in the context of the COVID-19 lockdown, there's a COVID garden syndrome and everyone has gone into this, uh, you know, modality of survival where we forget our cultural differences and all of us Malaysians are growing and foraging as much as we can. Save fresh produce from our gardens. 
and um, and away, I think, from the aesthetic beauty of home decor and scent. But somewhere, I think there's there's still women and men who love the scent of flowers and the scent of women. And here, I like to pay tribute to our lovely hens and show you a video of them in the garden eating up and devouring our bunga telang, our pea flower. This is our hill slope where we actually, uh, you know, try to regenerate the soil with our compost. So the pea flowers have grown wild next to our banana trees and our cassava. And you can see the hens devouring our pea flower. Yeah. We just share, all of us just share. Chickens, hens, humans, we share everything. Actually, just to tell you the truth, our cock was attacked by a monitor lizard, very sadly, and met a very sudden death. So this is in honor of a cock, okay? So uh, lastly, i like to actually share with you a famous Malay proverb on the scent of the jasmine and love. Saharumnya bunga melati, tidak sama saharumnya cinta ku kepadamu. As fragrant as the jasmine is, it does not surpass the fragrance of my love for you. So thank you very much for listening. And do not forget to smell a rose or a jasmine in the mornings and evenings. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dato. Thank you very much, um, Prof, for that um, lovely talk uh, about the fragrances and the flavors of Malay Garden. Um, uh, where we'll start with our question and answer se session. Um, we have a few um, questions which are, uh, um, we have here. Um, now, um, t uh, tell us a little bit about the community garden, a little bit more about the community garden you're involved with in, in Penang. Um, we, you... we actually involved in an Ulam Garden Club, which was start, started by Kulsama Nasutin, a very famous conservationist here. But in the Garden Club, there's this other very famous uh, man, is, of course, uh, Eric. We call him Eric the Champ, Eric the Hero. And he's got this amazing community garden in Sungai Ara, where, he, where you know many different families of the neighborhood and also NGOs and some elderly people like in the Qigong Club. They have planted, you know, squashes, tomatoes, legumes, beans. And this garden is open to everybody. And anyone can go and anyone can pluck anything they want, but with a certain amount of moderation and reservation and bring their kids to enjoy it. And what I find so amazing about this neighborhood is that they actually bring their children in to share the activities and the kids actually collect water with the help of their moms and their dads from the river and they water the plants, they water the vegetables and the old people are there helping them along. And on and off, Eric and his friends, you know, they have their little tea parties, their little nyonya kuehs and nihun. And I think this is a, an amazing feat. And community gardens in Penang have taken off like in a storm. And we have yes. another one in my neighborhood in Tanjung Puna. It's also started by another famous professor, Professor Swan. Uh, uh, and also here, it is also by the riverside, Sungai Krien. It hasn't taken off like in full force as the Sungai Ara, but it's got a lot of potential. The Suai Klian is one of the biggest, most beautiful rivers in this part of Penang. And of course, it's not Great A like Eric's river is, but our river will soon make it from Great B to Great A with the help of Professor Swan. Well, I hope so, yeah. Prof. Um, in yeah. fact, um, uh, I know there, there are a lot, a lot of um, community gardens sprouting out all over the, the country. And um, in fact, Badam Warisan um, itself is. Um, uh, planning to have a, we we already have a, a heritage garden at our um, headquarters at uh, Two Jalan Stoner, but uh, we're thinking of expanding that into a community garden to uh, provide um, 
That's oh, wonderful. And don't forget yeah. those scented flowers I talked about as well. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> not not just edible, but yeah, scented. As edible, well. scented, edible, non-scented, edible also to admire and to you know smell. That's but, so therapeutic. Actually, <laughs> it brings so much happiness and joy just to smell a, a, a fragrant flower. Um, how? I've got some more questions here. Uh, let's have a look. Um, a uh, question from Selena. One of the listeners. Hello, Prof. How easy is it to plant the fragrant flowers in the garden? What kind of soil do they like? Uh, shade? Uh, do they like what kind of soil? Do they like shade? Um, oh well, it depends on the flower. Like uh, roses need more shade and very good soil, you know. But the gardenia is a very hardy, very hardy plant. It loves the full sunshine. But you also need to mix your soil. If it's laterite with a lot of compost and good organic manure, like goat's manure or something like that. And then you can see it taking off really, really fast. Uh, I've got a few cuttings of a gardenia, I promise to some of my friends in the club, for their moms. And I was so happy to hear that they wanted the gardenia for their moms, you know, to enjoy in the garden. And I think uh, for those people who are making them into teas this is a whole new fabric a whole new dimension of fragrant flowers as well yeah i have another so, question uh, for yeah. you from ivy um i have jasmines and gardenia in my garden i'd like to eat them how do i go about it do i pick the <laughs> petals and steep in water ah uh, yes you you have to do like a infusion you know, put it in uh, hot water, then close the close the cup or the jar and actually leave it for a few hours. So uh, you can then add honey in it or you can actually add uh, a little bit of green tea, if you like, or other types of teas, like rose teas. And, you know, uh, you must actually drain it before you drink, of course. I've never, frankly, eaten a gardenia or a jasmine. So, you know, I think this would be like a whole new dimension to fragrant flowers. Yeah. There's another question. Um, is, uh, is, it, is gardenia a native of Malaysia? The native it plant is, of Malaysia? It is really a very interesting question because the Malay, the Malay uh, word is bunga china. And I think they probably got this from maybe the ancient gardens you know you would see like in malacca and maybe in parts of penang and maybe in parts of southeast asia but i think it is pretty much native to southeast asia i would think yeah um another question we have from um Sir Zainur. is there a traditional way of extracting essential oil from flowers that's not too difficult uh, essential oil from flowers that are not? Yes. Is there a traditional way of extracting essential oil from flowers? Well, I'm not very uh, familiar with essential oils, but I think there are many ways uh, of extracting essential oils from flowers. And this is something you need uh, to specialize in, I think. You can actually mix it with uh, other types of oils for example like coconut oil and you can actually uh, infuse the flower and soak it with uh, coconut oil and uh, with other types of fragrant herbs for example like pandan um, but in in detail essential oils are made in very specialized uh, shops you know by people who make perfumery and the, the technique is also distillation which is a very slow process which I have not done before but I think it is like the basic to all types of perfumery to do essential oils and to combine different types of essential oils towards perfumery. I know that many young entrepreneurs are now starting to make their own oils from local flowers like gardenias and jasmine and orchids. And I'm looking forward to trying out these new perfumes that are coming into the, the local market. 
Yes. I'm not an expert on essential oil. I just know. <laughs> There's you know, a, um, a question here from another question um, about flowers um, um, from Mas, Mas Jaliza. Have you yes. come across Bunga Antoy? My paternal grandmother used to put it in her homemade co uh, coconut oil and gift the hair oil to my maternal grandmother. The flower is cream colored, tiny petaled, small flower. I ask every flower stall owner at Pasatani, so far, no luck. Have people heard about it? Ah, uh, yes. It has appeared and surfaced in our garden club, Bunga Antoy. But actually, no one has actually managed to get hold of this plant. And I think with so much interest in it, it might surface. But there was something I saw similar to the Bunga Antoy when I was doing my research on Kerry Island with the Orang Asli. And I think uh, this flower was actually put in, you know, the orang asli's wear flowers in the hair. But I haven't come across this with any Malay families in Penang, definitely not. Possibly in the older areas in Pera or Pahang, we might get this. Yeah. Inter that's interesting. Bunga Atoy, yeah. I must look it up. Um, we have a. Um, a question um, about ulam. Uh, what are the essential from Vanessa? What are the essential uh, herbs and flowers in an ulam? Um, the the kind of combinations one can make in an ulam is actually infinite. You know, you can go to your garden and you can actually pluck any edible shoots, even the the umbra. You know, the condondo shoots. You can actually pluck young shoots of the guava. Or the mango steen, or the, or, or you know, the mango, and you can, of course, the essential ones would be like the ulam raja, or the kusum, and you know, the 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 selis, the selasi, uh, pagaga, yeah, selasa pagaga. All these would be the essential uh, herbs for an ulam, and as long as you get seven or more, that would be fine. It has to be seven, does it? Is it? Seven is like the magic number. Magic this number. This is what we grew up with. And I think even the Nyonyas are very particular about the numbers of shoes you can put in an ulam, you know. Of course, the ulam gets more tasty when you pound salted fish in it or, you know, dried shrimps. And even uh, powder blachan or shrimp paste, you know, then it gets very tasty. I've seen... I've seen uh, modern ulam, you know, uh, enthusiasts who actually put in colored cabbage and, you know, uh, uh, even capsicums and things like that. Or chilies, of course, green and, and, and red chilies. So, you know, yeah. There's a question here about for, um, I, I guess, people um, in this um, shrinking spaces. Um, in, in urban areas where people do not have the luxury of having their own garden um, and they live in apartments and flats. So what kind of plants would um, they be able to grow or um, in flats? Or yeah, I think, I think this is a really uh, important question and I, I believe that every apartment or flat would have a veranda and it depends which side the veranda is facing. I think if there's a lot of uh, morning sunlight coming in, you know, herbal aromatics like lemongrass and pandan, and even ginger species would do very well there. But if the garden was, uh, if the veranda was more secluded, I think other kind of plants like roses or orchids would do very well. I like to say that in the context of the verandas, I would like to see developers making these verandas bigger or maybe in, in apartment blocks and, and, and flats to actually have the developers, to insist that the developers have shared community spaces, you know, on the ground floor for them to have their community gardens. And once these community gardens take off, on the grounds of these apartment blocks and flats, the, the veranda space becomes less important and, the kids can actually have their potted plants there, the little cactus plants, you know, and they can actually play there. So I would think that the Malaysian government should put this in full force since there's a whole new powerful green movement taking place here. 
And the green people of Malaysia would like to see apartment landscapes, you know, changing rapidly. And I think a lot of countries in the world like UK, Australia, New Zealand already have these shared spaces, these shared community gardens in these blocks. And I like to see Malaysia having this too. That's an excellent idea. Um, uh, I, I don't know whether you, I'm not sure whether you answered this, this question. There is a question from Marion, which is which types of, um, on, I've just lost it. <laughs> which types of herbs can grow on a south and east facing balcony? Uh, it receives full sun until about 2.30. Both suns until 2.30. I would say uh, maybe lemongrass and pandan would also do well. But the pandan tree that is grown there, must the pandan plant or bush, must already be fairly mature before you transfer it to the veranda. Other, other than that, it would take it very well. And I think... Uh, Possibly you could actually grow uh, certain types of ginger. Um, maybe... She does, she does ask an additional question, which is, yeah. is, uh, is turmeric easy to grow in pots? Turmeric is very easy to grow in pots. I have turmeric grown in pots and also on the ground. In fact, if you have a, a very good uh, compost soil or organic soil, you know, everyone's buying a six in one and you mix it with a little bit of fine sand and, and compost. Turmeric grows beautifully in big pots. Excellent. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> I have a friend who grows, uh, uh, you know, she even grows lengkwas, you know, galangal in pots. Now, galangal would do very well in a garden which has morning and afternoon sun or in a veranda which has morning and afternoon sun. And Glangal can grow really big, you know. Well, you can also grow cactus. Cactus is edible. The, you know, many types of cactus are edible. Aloe vera. Aloe vera is very edible. Yeah, we, yeah. we grow some in some planters here in my house. As well. Aloe vera. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a following on for that. There's another question. Uh, uh, what kind of, hang on, what kind of, um, Flowers or herbs would you recommend for a beginner to start planting? For beginners? Yes. Um, I'd be interested in that. I don't have green fingers, <laughs> but maybe I would discover say, I do. Uh, I would say flowers which are like associated with um, seeds. You know, if you could get lots of seeds, maybe of like, you know, the balsam, for example, that would be very easy to grow. You know, and uh, types of dahlias, chrysanthemums, those would be very easy to grow if you can just scatter these and watch them grow. That you question know. was from Aina. I hope you. Sorry. Yeah, that that question was from um, uh, one of our listeners called Aina. And uh, okay. there's another one, uh, uh, Professor from Ida. Um, what kind of herbs are not easy to plant? And is it true that down Kasum need to be planted in a pot without bottom holes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, down because some has to be waterlogged. A bit yeah, like I the, do. you know, water hyacinth or the kangkong. Uh, I have planted kasom before, but I didn't put it in a proper place and, you know, it dried up really fast. You've got to, to, to have a waterlogged area for kasom, just like kangkong. Uh, what any... I find very hard to grow is actually like the uh, not the fake deal, the original deal, uh, herbs which are actually imported, like the rosemary. We have long discussions on rosemary bushes, why they die. And actually, uh, one of those in our garden club said that it actually needs sun, but not direct sun. A lot of us like immediately put it in the shade. And different types of uh, mint, for example, like lemon mint, it's really not that easy to grow. Or, you know, certain types of like, uh, you know, lemon basil, for example. I just can't manage to grow it well. No, but I have, uh, you know, Thai basil, which grows like into a big bush in my garden. And even some people even have problems with basil. It depends. 
very much on our soil and how much their loving care we give to our herbs. Uh, you mentioned yeah. was it was it lime lime mint was it lemon mint yeah. lemon mint oh, yeah okay. I actually got the plant once from Sungai Bulo and it just died on me after uh, mm. two three weeks and I was really very upset because it's very okay. hard to actually grow some of these more you know uncommon types of mint. I, I think, think I, I think we have a we have a plant in there. You do, country. yes. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's doing quite well. So I must find out whether it's the it is a lemon mint. Um, wow. oh, we've got quite mm. quite a lot of questions coming in. Um, yes, another one from uh, Master Lisa, Professor. What about bunga tongking, a type of jasmine? We talk about it in our Facebook Edible Garden group. Bunga tongking. Yes. Yeah, I'm not very familiar with this jasmine. There are like 15, 16 types of jasmine, right? Yeah. Are they? Are yeah, nice? there are 15, 16 types of jasmine and, and I have like three in my garden. Uh, you know, it's, they're not really like... Not all of them are like even indigenous to Malaysia. So could she share with us maybe in a chat or share with me because I haven't really... Um, what the what Seen the plant it. is? Yes. Right. If you um, so, Master Lisa, if you have a a photograph of the Bungatong King, or um, it's yes, probably or, called by a different name here in Penang. Don't know. We have that, so yeah, many that types. That might be true. That does happen. Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh. Let's have a look for um uh, some more questions. Um. Have ah, it's mostly so women. Tuning in. It's mostly yeah. women, yes, it is. Um, it looks like it from the question. The questions are mostly <laughs> from women. Um, yeah. From Suraya Emrus, uh, can the flowers of Jarum Tujo Bilah be eaten? I've been tempted to mix them along with the Telang flowers to beautify my nasi bilang. I think it is edible, yeah. With bunga Telang, yeah. The, I, no, have... I think she, the flowers of Jarum Tujo Bilah. The flowers of Jarum Chochok Bila. Eaten with Jarum bunga Tujo telang, Bila. she said? She said, can the flowers of Jarum Tujo Bila be eaten? I've been tempted to mix them along with the uh, telang flowers to beautify my nasi ulam. I think uh, it, could be, it could be edible. See, the thing is not all flowers taste nice. The bunga telang also doesn't really taste nice, but it is very pretty. You know, in an ulam, most of these flowers don't really taste that great, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they have uh, more medicinal qualities, or is it the fragrance that? Yeah, that that's do? right. Yeah, but the jasmine doesn't really taste that nice. Yeah, the flowers that are quite tasty would be like the ginger flowers, I would think, like the kantan and the you know, uh, you know, the flowers of the ginger. Kunit, turmeric, all types of turmeric flowers would be very tasty. There's a question yeah. here from Rani. Um, good morning, Professor. Says, Is the term Malay garden applicable for other Peranakan gardens, such as Baba Nyonya, Jawi, and other Peranakan in Malaysia? Yes. Actually, when I used the word Malay, it was just an umbrella term to refer to all types of urban landscape uh, gardens. And it would refer, I did mention earlier to the Jawi Pekan, the Jawi Pranakan, to the Pranakan China, the Nyonya Baba groups, and to the Swiss Muslims, because most of us, and also to the Cheti uh, Pranakan, because most of us would share the same plants and flowers in our gardens. Yeah. This is a unifying factor about all the Pranakans. A lot of them share the same herbs and flowers. Yeah. In the garden. Yeah. Um, another question uh, from Tari. Th Thari, is it correct to say Malays prefer scent and flavor over visual aesthetics in their garden design? Well, for my generation, for the older generation, you know, those who are above 50, I would say that the Malays really relish and treasure flowers for their scent. And, you know, a lot of these scented flowers are the gardenia, and the mellow, they're just white and they're just, I mean, compared to like the rose, compared to like hibiscus types, hybrid hibiscus is 
they actually look quite plain, but these these flowers are actually the scent is actually uh, so aromatic and so fragrant that you know p women of my generation would actually love these flowers for their scent. But of course, there are many beautifully scented flowers, you know, which are also uh, nice to look and nice to to to, to breathe in. You know, the scent like for example the the Sundal Malam, for example, it's a very beautiful cluster of flowers. Even the uh, Myanmese jasmine, the Burmese jasmine, which is now so popular and cascades over everyone's porch, which comes in different clusters of pink, white, and red. That flower is really so beautiful to look at and to grow, but not to eat because I've actually decorated that on my cakes and I've actually crystallized that with sugar for some of my uh, icing effects and it actually just looks very beautiful but it doesn't really taste that nice. Yeah. Roses taste very nice. There's a question here from... Uh, um, sugar coated or not. Yeah. Question here from uh, Fahim. Prof, any edible tea which is cooling as in, like, as in uh, blue pea, bunga telang lemonade? Uh, why don't you try uh, uh, Lamuni, you know, Vitex nigundu. This is a very popular plant amongst the uh, Pranakan Muslims, the Jawi Pranakan, because it is used as a tea for the afterbirth and it is also mashed and cooked in rice. So you get the Lamuni rice, the bluish purple rice, which is also looks really beautiful when it is cooked with Bunga Telang. And uh, this makes a, a lovely tea as well. You know, we could have we could have that as a tea. And I think uh, there's so many other types of teas which we could enjoy. Could you repeat you the, the uh, what was the name of the tea uh, the the beef you just mentioned? Lamuni. Lamuni. Ah, uh, there's actually uh, also vitex okay. nigundu. You know, vitex trifolia. There's so many types of vitex. Uh, you know, the nonchi, the nonchi tea as well, which is made into a rice, the nonchi rice. Uh, what about the famous pandan, pandan tea, which is also really wonderful. And lemongrass tea, lemongrass and pandan makes a beautiful tea together. And so yeah, you already have something so easy to get and something so refreshing to drink. And also very, very, you know, Therapeutic as well, these teas. They have a calming effect. We have a know. question from um, Christine Tan. Can every hibiscus be eaten? Uh, I think the traditional hibiscuses, which are Malayan, there's so many new hybrid hibiscuses which are coming into the market in the nurseries. I'm not familiar with these hibiscuses. I think the important thing is that, and my son collects them, but the important thing is that. We don't know whether these hibiscus, when you buy them, were actually treated with organic fertilizer or maybe with uh, chemical fertilizers. And I would advise everyone not to eat any flower which is grown on chemical fertilizers. Yeah. Very interesting, very um, and a useful tip for people. Okay. <laughs> Um, Not to eat it raw, maybe. Maybe, maybe to infuse it, yeah. All right. <laughs> but we've got to be very careful with chemical fertilizers, I think. The trend now is organic yes. and to make your own fertilizers. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I do think I do agree with that. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a question from Ahmad Norfitri. Does Prof take in apprentices? Oh, uh, actually, my, my our restaurant, Jawi House Cafe Gallery, um, has taken in apprentices before, but these are like uh, master students who want to spend some time with us, or uh, diploma students, and also students who come for a day or two to actually like interview us on Jawi Pranakan Cuisine. Because Jawi Pranakan Cuisine is very unique to Malaysia, and we are the first restaurant in Malaysia to actually serve Jawi Pranakan food. So we get a lot of students uh from culinary art schools who come to interview chef Nouriel and me actually i run away from them 
because there's, sometimes there's an avalanche from them and I pass them on to Nora. Nora has to cope with a lot of these students who come. But uh, they can come on just for a couple of hours and have a drink and talk to Nora about Jawi Pranakan food. But a lot of the food which we actually cook now, the herbs in Jawi House are all organic from our garden. So there could be another mm -hmm. new trend. Jawi Pranakan food, which is organic and which is really very easy to grow in your own garden as well. That's, uh, so um, would you say how, how much percentage of, of the products in the restaurant are um, organically grown? Uh, I would say most of the local herbs we have are organically grown and the local vegetables. Of course, uh, there are certain vegetables which we avoid now. We, uh, we don't buy like French beans, you know, because of the packaging. And, you know, we don't buy many imported types of uh, tomatoes as well. We just, now we are outsourcing most of our products from farms, actually. There, there, there are uh, families which have farms in um, Balik Pulau, and they actually call us and contact us when they have, uh, you know, uh, extra beans or legumes, or when they have uh, jackfruits to or, or chiku to for us to put in our salads or to make in our curry. Uh, most of the Malay food, which is like uh, cooked with coconut milk, like our jackfruit and our, you know, which ubi kayu, for example, our cassava. Our lemoni, that's all organic from our garden. Yeah. Excellent. I think um, there's a question here um, about your book and when will it be available to... Um, yeah, we're just to, putting the... Yeah, that uh, question was from Singapore, by the way. Oh, we're Emilia. putting the finishing touches to it. And hopefully when we get a publisher, uh, a firm publisher, because there's been lots of queries and interest, but we also want a publisher which can actually circulate the book very well and actually circulate it uh, at a moderate price in Malaysia for young uh, young farmers. Farmers, a term invented by Eric of uh, Sungai Ara. Uh, we what? want young farmers to actually buy this book. So we would like the price to be affordable. So we're actually still looking for this. We might make it into an ebook as well and publish and print as according to demand. So it should sense. be out like maybe less than five months, I would think. Yeah. There's another question. Those are about, a lot of questions. Yeah, there are a lot of questions. And uh, there's another, one more um, uh, from Murev. Salam. Can Bunga Welcome Akar, salam. Uh, can Bunga Akar Dani or Sarangun Creepers flowers be eaten as ulam? Mm not so tasty but very pretty if you put it on top of the ulam you know if you just uh scattered about but i have done it actually it doesn't taste that great but it looks beautiful it can be eaten it's edible yeah uh, there's a comment from um christine i think it was response to your um uh, uh response to your suggestion of having the um, shared spaces for uh, community spaces in condos and, and, and apartment blocks. So she said, from Christina, sadly, new developers concrete front gardens in PJ. It is a fashion that should be forbidden by law. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we uh, must protest against that. And there must be a movement to prevent this and to actually talk to the city council not to pass these plans. They have to go to DBKL, they have to go to the Penang City Council. Why are the councils allowing this? The green mm. movement in Malaysia, in the cities, and is so powerful. I mean, there's some clubs which have like sixty to seventy thousand members. We can start a green party and actually challenge existing governments <laughs> that come, you know, pass these kind of plans. Yeah, that's very. That's, that's, statement, a very interesting that's my point. statement for the week. <laughs> I think. Uh, I think. Uh, I think a lot of people will vote for you, for, for, if, you so started, if you started a green party. 
<laughs> no, we want Eric to start it and people, all the enthusiasts of the fun fans, cool summer, I'm a bit too old. But the next generation, the younger ones, they sort of be like marching forward, you know. I think we Penang agree. is amazing. We, I, I I love Penang for this spirit decor, this camaraderie, yes. you know, amongst all ethnic groups and all nations together as one in our gardens. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Um, there's one. Uh, there's one question here, which um, uh, from Sharina. Could you share with us some tips on how do you keep yourself more motivated and productive amidst all the challenges? Um, <laughs> Thanks for the inspiration, Prof. Thank you so much, dear. Actually, I don't know what keeps me going. It's actually this because each time I feel like I want to retire and just enjoy my garden, a whole new issue crops up. You know, for example, like uh, our poison rivers and our poison, you know, gardens and also, you know, contaminated seas and, you know, our poor fishermen being... Uh, you know, a marginalized, resettled. And for me, my heart and soul is with the Orang Asli, whom I've lived with for like decades and decades. And I see their, their forests shrinking and getting smaller. And I see them getting more and more worried and concerned. And going back again to the songs of the past, the songs of the children to try and create this kind of rebirth in the environment, to create a notion of cycl uh, cyclical time that time doesn't move on towards industrialization and towards, uh, you know, disaster. Time moves to infinity, to beauty, to holism, to happiness. And this is what I like to see. And, I, uh, you know, when things go wrong and buckle under your feet, you feel you have to do something. And a lot of us are like that. We're still trying to conserve not just our buildings, our environment, our lifestyles, our livelihood. And that beautiful Malaysian spirit we shared before, a spirit of comradery and togetherness and cohesion. Well, thank you very much, Professor. I think that's a very good note to end on. I think we've... we've thank uh, you very much, Dr. We've I'm... reached, we've reached uh, almost an hour. We've, I think there's still some more questions coming in, but we can collect them and, and pass them on to you. But I think uh, yes, thank, you thank you so much for um, your talk this morning. You're and we're looking welcome. forward um, to... Oh, there was one question about... Where would um, uh, where would uh, your restaurant be? The restaurant be in Penang. Someone wants to do a pit oh, stop. Oh, it's and... on Armenian Street, number eighty-five Armenian Street. Eighty-five. Do look Armenian. us up. Yeah, we'd be very happy to meet you and share our experiences of Jawi Pradat Khan food and holistic foods with you. Yeah. Right. Thank you very Thank much, Professor. Uh, yeah. It was a pleasure having you. Um, Thank you. Give the talk Have a beautiful and... Sunday. Yes, yeah. you too. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Well, um, we've got 76 listeners left. I hope um, you enjoyed um, that hour we spent with uh, Professor um, Emerita Dato Dr. Wazir. Um, if any of you, are, I'm not sure if everyone's members here, but um, of Baran Waisan, but if you're not, um, if you look at the slide um, that's being shown now, you can look up at our um, various social media uh, um, pages and uh, find out more information about that. There's also, I think, a file that's being um, delivered to the chat room, which you can download, which will give more information about our different uh, membership uh, programs. And uh, also, if you would like to donate to Baden Ryzen, we are a registered charity. Um, we survive on the kindness of uh, private individuals and corporations. And uh, the last year has been particularly difficult to um, raise funds. Um, we haven't had um, the opportunity to um, for various reasons, and um, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, so if you'd like to donate, and please do, um, the information is available on the slide and also in the file that you can download the chat room. So with that, I'd like to um, end today's session and thanking, uh, thank you very much to Think City for um, helping us uh, put up this talk, this webinar today. Uh, they've been very useful and uh, very helpful. And I will um, 
end there. Thank you very much. And I uh, hope to see you at our next talk or hear you. Maybe not. <laughs> see you. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Thank <laughs> you.